Um, so as I say, I am delighted to introduce you to Roy today. Um, Roy Childs, you can see him, he's on the screen there. Uh, Roy is the Managing Director of Team Focus. And as I said, he's talking to us today about how to make feedback more useful and long lived. Roy is an Associate Fellow of the British Psychological Society and a Chartered Occupational Psychologist. His background in psychometrics includes having worked with some of the best known authors of personality questionnaires, including Ray Cattell, 16PF, and Will Schutz, uh, known for FIRO, uh, if I remember it rightly, Fundamental Interpersonal Relations Orientation. I hope that's right, Roy. Good. Good. Uh, with Team Focus, he's developed a new range of instruments designed to bring psychometrics into the 21st century. Roy runs the widest range of BPS recognised qualifying courses in the UK. And some of his publications include The Psychometric Minefield, Emotional Intelligence and Leadership, The Big Five, Bring a Little Colour into Your Lives, Coaching with Firo Element B, published in the Psychometric psychometrics and coaching book, action learning supervision published in coaching supervision and the relational lens published by Cambridge University Press. So a very well read, well written um, guest that we have with us today. And Roy is also one of our trusted providers with the trusted coach directory. That is plenty from me. Roy, if you're ready, I'm going to hand over to you. Yes, I'm. I'm ready. Thank you all for joining. Um, and interesting to think about your purpose for joining, because I was saying to Helen before you all came on how I know some coaches actually say, well, we don't give feedback uh, very often because they sort of conflate feedback with advice and we don't give advice. But do we give feedback? Um, and uh, you, you said a lot there, Helen, in terms of sort of the range of psychometrics. I mean, I'm here I'm looking at the question much more generally, but I will also uh, use illustrations because of the specific nature of how uh, both psychometrics and 360 influence or uh, need to be handled in a way in terms of feedback. Um, so I am going to share screen and I would suggest I've opened the chat this time, which I didn't last time, so I'll be able to see, but I won't monitor that. But if, as I go through, there are things that you'd like to pick up at the end, maybe that would be a good place to do it. And maybe you could monitor that, Helen. Yeah? Okay. So I'll begin by sharing screen. There. And ask if you can see that. Yep. OK, <clears throat> so feedback and making it more effective. I mean, there's all kinds of way of phrasing what I've said there. But um, if we think about it, I mean, first of all. Could you hear that? You could. Yeah, there's just a little bit of very brief interference. Right. Well, that's what you were supposed to hear. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> because what I'm saying is that uh, feedback is often used in that sense, in that negative sense. Uh, and so really, when we talk about feedback ourselves, it's not always a problem. Oh, how does it move on? Yes, OK. So what do we mean by feedback? And I'm going to use an analogy which generalises it, but that is to think about, about the way in which uh, this creature navigates its world, which is the bat, and how it sends out signals, and then it gets a reflection back. And the whole thing about feedback is that it is about navigating your way through. So in coaching, we can be seeing it as like the <clears throat> feedback of the person uh, talking and the coach then being the reflective sounding board. Okay, So we're giving it back, we're letting them, and that helps them to adjust their direction or their understanding or their, and we know that fundamentally under there is a concept of, uh, of self-awareness. So 
And the key skill that we have as coaches is obviously uh, listening. Uh, but what we actually reflect back is part of the skill. As you know, where you are listening and there may be a lot of words and you might just might pick out a couple of words to reflect back, which is part of that then, ah, yes, what am I meaning and renavigating like that? Now, I said that the types of feedback, first of all, there's the positive, okay? And then you've got the negative. And we sometimes have more difficulty with managing the negative. And that is an important part of us as coaches that we recognize in our coach training is that we have to understand what our issues are with that. It's not just about how we're handling it because at the heart of this, I, I would say that we are really thinking about the person in terms of their identity, their uniqueness, okay? So that's them. And when we're talking about positive feedback, which is much easier to give, I mean, first of all, let's think about, I mean, can you see the, is that my, are all your images on the screen? Yeah, I've moved it out of the way. So thinking about identity as a more general concept of what we're dealing with. And roles are very much part of our identity, but we need to understand what it is that we're giving feedback on, because values are also very important part of our identity, as is personality and as are our emotions. They're all part of us. So we need to be sensitive in understanding that in giving feedback, we are dealing with people's sense of identity, which is hugely core to the way in which they are navigating and experiencing life. So coming back to the thing there about, uh, you know, the fears that we have about feedback, positive feedback is relatively easy for us because it's like nurturing, watering the plant. It's helping, you know, it's easy to give. And the problem with negative, it's a bit like damaging, you know, knocking into, or it can feel like that. So what do we do as coaches? We learn to deliver what is potentially negative in a positive or a useful way. And useful is probably the better word for that. But there is always the fear underlying that, that it is damaging identity. So we tend to be very careful about things which are not so positive. And as I say, we need to think about that not just as protecting them, but also what it is in doing of protecting us and protecting our identity as coaches, as positive helpers of individuals. So <clears throat> one of the things in that is to remind ourselves that first of all, identity is multifaceted. There are many strands to it. And when we're giving feedback, we are only picking out certain strands. And those strands, it goes down to the another level, which is when we are giving feedback around specific attributes, they are also multifaceted. And I'd like you to think about an example, which is confidence. I hear so often, especially around sort of uh, psychometric feedback about, you know, you seem to be a confident or lacking in confidence, etc. But if you examine your own confidence, I mean, everyone that I know is confident in certain areas and not confident in others. Nobody is universally confident. And yet we often treat these attributes as great blankets over all of these strands. So in thinking about feedback, we need to think about honing it down to the elements that we are dealing with so that the individual doesn't generalize it to their whole identity themselves. So all attributes are also multifaceted. But what feedback? Well, let's think about this because it's another, and some of you may have, I don't know if it's been published yet, uh, Helen, but the blog on 
personality and behaviour. I think it has, hasn't it? Oh, I'd have to double check. OK. Well, anyway, there is a blog which may be coming or it may already be there. But thinking about, and this is a metaphor for things, which gets back to a fairly fundamental thing that is a received wisdom in coaching. So stick with the metaphor for a minute. Life is a tug of war. And that tug of war is between my identity and the world I inhabit. And the world I inhabit sometimes challenges my identity. Sometimes it creates my identity. Uh, sometimes it changes my identity. But there is always a dynamic, con uh, dynamic tension between the context that I'm in and the person that I am. Okay. And this is where I think many of the psychometrics certainly get it wrong, is that they often treat personality as the behavior that is going on in between. And in my view, behavior is a consequence of the dynamic tension. It is, and sometimes the context is the dominant force. And my behavior is really determined by what is happening you know, in a flood, in a fire, what I do is so much determined by the context. And that, you know, to use less dramatic examples, is always the case, you know. And my behaviour with my kids might be very different from with, you know, the competition in the uh, football team or whatever it is. Um, so recognising this dynamic tension and separating behaviour from identity, although behavior sometimes does give us a window into people's identity, but it is not always the same thing. So in terms of the way I think about this is a really important distinction between what I call being and doing. Being is who I am, and that's on the inside, and it is not always evident on the outside, okay? And behaviour is sometimes reflecting identity, but sometimes it's reflecting context, and usually it's reflecting a mix of the two. So bearing that in mind then, you know, the problem with feedback sometimes is that we haven't been sufficiently clear in that differentiation between being and doing. And helping your coachee to recognize that can often make it easier and more useful because you can give people information about behavior and people can separate themselves and think about what they're going to do and to change but we don't always just want behavior to change sometimes it is identity change because identity is an evolving process an identity with maturity is actually growing self-awareness. And we all have certain narratives about ourselves. I sometimes call them delusions about ourselves. We have stories about ourselves and they sometimes need readjusting because am I really, am I really that kind of person? And maybe I was that kind of person, but have I changed? And recognizing, and in this, and as coaches, I think we're all on board with the thing that we are helping people to grow and develop and change is part of that process. But recognizing that change is both on the inside and the outside, it is behavior and identity that we are working with. So sometimes the feedback is around elements of people's identity. So what derails feedback and one of the key things is defensiveness if people are feeling defensive any kind of feedback is likely to bounce off it's likely to be rejected pushed aside trivialized however we do that and so recognizing defensiveness and it's a two-way thing, defensiveness in ourselves as well, but defensiveness is in our client, is a very useful lens that we have to see how people are working with information which is arising 
from the process that we're going through. So you can think about a um, uh, you know, simple way to classify defensiveness is into these sort of passive resistance, sort of oh, I'm not really on board with this, et cetera, uh, doing it that way. Or what some people often see as defensive, which is the much more active aggression type of defensiveness. And then you've got the fearful avoidance defensiveness. I mean, we deal with these things and we probably do a little bit of all of those. Now, coaches probably do a little bit of each of these in different circumstances, going from active aggression to passive resistance or withdrawing from the situation or whatever. And I thought it might be useful then if you could recognize your own defensiveness. You've probably done some work on this, but I'm just going to ask you to spend a couple of minutes, piece of paper. I still use paper myself. You know, you may have, want to bash it into your notes or whatever, but write down, what do you do when you get defensive? Just write a couple of things down. What do you notice? Try and write more than one thing. Because the definition of defences is that they are usually unconscious or at the time they are happening unconsciously. But with reflection, you might recognise what is going on. Um, so what do you do when you get defensive? Think of it through another lens now. What would other people notice about you when you're getting defensive? And you can think back to the, the three things I put earlier, but um, if you need a little bit of help, here's a list of things. I hope you can read that. If you're looking at this on a phone, you probably can't. Um, but, you know, there are all the physical signs, the tension in your body. Or what happens to some people is they suddenly get so tired. Oh, oh exhausted. I mean, these are things which, you know, we often don't actually log as me getting defensive. But as we become aware of this, you know, it might be there. And you could see this in your coaches when they sort of, either get tired or they're losing energy or, um, you know, the inauthentic smile. But there's all those other things like, you know, loss of humour. You know, there's the one here, I think I've got it. Yeah, the, the sudden drop in IQ. You know, you stop understanding, well, what are you saying? Oh, I don't get it. You know, you know clarify what you mean. You, you're suddenly, you know, you're, you're pushing it away in that way. Um, so there's a whole load of things there which can be useful. And I think it's useful to log your own, but it's also useful to, uh, to recognise these in your client because you would have to work on it with people because if they are not open to feedback, if they are inclined to get defensive with, you know, with feedback at certain times, Learning to recognise it is a critical element because only when you learn to recognise it can you do something about it. Because as I say, it's sort of unconscious until you recognise it. I notice the tension in my body. I notice that I'm getting actually really aggressive and blaming you for everything that's going on. And I recognise that's what I do. I am, in terms of, let's say, the drama triangle is one of the models of defensiveness is you know i'm the persecutor you know or are you someone who is the rescuer many in the coaching uh space are probably rescuers you know here to save the day and i would suggest you know looking into these defenses a bit more i can give you a bit more in the victim you know so you, you may know this sort of the drama triangle with the uh you know, persecutors need victims and victims need rescuers, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a repeating pattern. Um, those of you that maybe 
have had a little bit more uh, formal introduction to defensiveness may recognize the I'm okay, you're okay, I'm not okay, etc. And thinking about in in the old sort of psychodynamic language of repression and denial, I'm the denier. Oh, it's fine, everything's fine, everything's falling down, but I just say it doesn't matter, etc. Um, and then there's a sort of a displacement where it's not me, it's you. So the blame of the critic, you know, uh, and that's a very common one in corporate life. You know, people have got to where they are by being highly, that's back to the sort of aggressor and sometimes the persecutor as well. And then you've got the projection where, you know, uh, I don't like myself, so uh, you obviously don't like yourself. So let me help you with that, you know, because you can't like yourself. I mean, people don't do that because we're projecting our view and our feelings about things onto the people around us. And then there's the identification, you know, so I'm not OK, but you are. Please tell me, give me more. You know, am I all right? Was that OK? Oh, et cetera. And there are other ways of doing that, because instead of demanding it from you, I just flagellate myself, et cetera. Or I become the victim as well. Now, those are I mean, those last two, the the, the sort of lists of, um, you know, signs of defensiveness I got from. Uh, working with Will Schutz, who logged all of these and put them on because he did a lot of work on recognising when people are defensive, because if people are defensive, they're not going to learn. You need to help them with that. <clears throat> but anyway, what else then derails defensiveness? And this is where it gets to really thinking about your coaching sessions, where we know that you sow seed on stony ground and it won't take root. And so you need to look at the ground and you need to do, what am I saying here? It is preparation. And I think one of the things that makes feedback less effective is insufficient preparation. And that preparation is insufficient, and that should say insufficient preparation of the coachee and insufficient efficient preparation by the coach okay so let me tell you a little bit more or suggest a little bit more about that of course you do preparation all good coaching is predicated on rapport and you've all got skills at doing that you are creating the space in which the person's defensiveness is likely to be lowered it's a safe space and there's a trust in you so we think about, about that and you can think about as the preparation of the thing and you've got an existing way of doing that i'm going to give you a few other ways of doing that but i think you should also think about how do you prepare for the coach session yourself and if you think about the coachee that you're going to see we have different relationships with different coaches, And it is true that we will like some more than others. We'll for, feel more energized by some than others. I remember asking Steve DeShazer, who was the uh, leading light in the brief therapy, now called solution of focus therapy thing, who developed brief therapy from dealing with some of the worst criminals in society who had to come and get some psychological help. So they were actually told to go. And um, he therefore dealt with paedophiles and rapists and all, all kinds of things. And I watched him working live and we questioned him after, afterwards. And I said, um, how do you deal with you know, your clients that you don't like. And he said, he closed his eyes and thought for a bit. I'm sure he'd been asked the question before, but he seemed to think for a bit. And then he says, I can't think of a client that I haven't liked. I was shocked. Uh, he qualified that because he said, because what we do in a way, is we are looking for the exceptions. And there is always something 
in everybody that is positive. And the whole brief therapy methodology is about finding those and growing the positives rather than focusing on the negatives. Okay. Um, so that idea of, you know, you, you're going to have clients, coaches that come in and you've got different sort of emotional reactions. You might love them all or you might tell yourself you love them all. But one of the things that I do then is I think about uh, preparing myself by trying to walk in their shoes. Before they come, I wonder where they are. I wonder what's going on for them. So I'm shifting my mindset from me to them and thinking about that before they enter the room. And that is part of my preparation. So <clears throat> prepare yourself as well, however you do that. But some tips for preparing the coachee. One of the things I've found particularly useful is, and here I'm going to use really the examples of either 360 degree feedback, which I think is a really good one in terms of uh, identifying the defensiveness that people have. You know, so often, you know, they're not showing it as tension in the body, but they are trivializing, well, what do they know about me? They hardly ever see me anyway. And the, what they're doing is they are really looking for the people that they can accept the feedback from. Now, all feedback is useful, but the danger is they become highly selective in that. So you can do it in terms of uh, 360, but it also applies to all kinds of psychometrics as well. And one of the things is that there is certainly with psychometrics that people start rubbishing the questionnaire that's just a quiz you know i mean what a load of rubbish etc and so one of the important things is if there is going to be feedback you need to think about the credibility of the source okay which means you know in 360 who are these people how were they chosen and the more they were chosen by the organization as opposed to the individual which still happens you know then the more likely it is that the person can start diminishing the feedback that they're getting from it um and as i say with the psychometrics and you know people start rubbishing the questionnaire when it's giving them the information they don't agree with and that is really unfair I mean, I'm going to suggest that you do choose the you know, model of feedback that is the most useful. And uh, it's better to use a well-constructed questionnaire than tea leaves. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, there is a thing about the, you know, what you're using and that is a credible source. So you need to establish that, you know, in some way or another. And then before any of this, before they get, any report or result, I'd like to prepare them using what I call the FIR model. Now, the FIR model, it's based on what uh, Lewin uh, calls, so you may recognise it, those of you who are familiar with uh, Lewin, but basically anyone that you're dealing with, each one of us has got a view about ourselves. And in the language of Bone, he said, the frozen self. There is always a pre-existing self-concept. Before I enter coaching, before I do a questionnaire, there is, this is me, and that's where I'm coming from. And what we're doing here, then, is helping people to look at not just the things that are going to reinforce what they already know, which is what so often happens. Think about 360 think about psychometrics oh i agree with that yeah that's right that's right yeah they know what they're talking about etc it's all that affirmation stuff now that is okay but we are in a growth and development context so if we don't change the frozen at all we're just affirming what was already there that isn't actually that useful it might be a way of gaining rapport or building credibility. So it has a purpose, 
but it is not actually the most useful part. So when I'm saying, look, we're going to have some feedback from whatever it is, and you already know a lot about yourself. I respect that. But in this process, what we are trying to do, and Lewin called it unfreezing, it involves shaking the preformed views of the self. So when you get that report or whatever, let's look at the things that you can agree with, but let's also look at the things where you're saying, hmm, not sure, I wonder, whatever it is. And once they've got that, and before they've even got this then, you are helping them to react differently to information that doesn't accord with the pre-existing self-concept. That then allows them to start considering what I call reformulation. Maybe I'm not so confident as I thought I was. Maybe I'm not such a happy-go-lucky. Maybe I am a lot more controlling than I ever wanted to believe, etc. Maybe, 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 which then allows me to, Lewin called it refreezing. I would like to call it reframing because quite often it's, changing the narrative about what I already knew, but casting it in a new light. And so this becomes a cycle. And introducing this to people before they get feedback then gets them much more tuned in, not to the things that they can agree with, but interested in the things that they don't agree with. And that's where we get a lot of value. Because as I say, without that preparation, very often the things I don't agree with just bounce off like Teflon. You know, boing, boing. No, well, what do they know they're talking about? They've never seen me do the real stuff. Now, this is something I haven't tried before, um, but I'm going to just try to give you a flavour of your reactions to feedback. It's very hard to do because I haven't got a report on each of you. So I've tried to write this in a way that might or it might not work. But if you go along with the role play a little bit and think about this statement. How opinionated are you? You're probably quite opinionated, really, aren't you? But I bet you that if somebody comes up with a reasonable argument, you'll be willing to change your mind. Do you agree with that? Does anyone not agree with that? So this is something which in a good profile report 360 is giving you information specifically about you. But those of you that have done any of the training with me will quickly recognize that this is what is known as a Barnum statement. Almost everybody's going to agree with it because the, the variability in that is what you call reasonable. OK, and we're all at a different scale. So some people are much more open. Some people are much, you know, you haven't made your case properly yet. Now, this is those of you that read the blog on the ACDC, I'm introducing you to the ACDC model, uh, which helps you to recognize what's happening in your feedback situation. As I say, whether it's psychometrics, whether it's 360 or other kinds of feedback. But this is the affirmation stage where people are saying, that's right. And this is what helps to build that credibility, that credibility of the source of that feedback. Yeah, yeah, they're right. They're perceptive. You know, that question there is not so much rubbish after all, etc. Then we go on to the next one, which is, Think how persuasive you are. You may not, and most people in this audience would not like to even view themselves as a typical salesperson, person, but you've got an unusual ability to connect with people, which means that people see you as more persuasive than you actually think you are. But you considered that. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to use that. So your reaction to that, maybe I'm using it as the communication thing, which is, I did know that, but yeah, that's, but that's the, that's how I can describe it. So we find better ways of articulating 
the things that we, we sort of know in ourselves, but very often we aren't very good at communicating it. And this is something which is so strong in adolescence. The very, very difficult way of articulating, who am I? What, what, yeah. And you find that feedback, certainly psychometric feedback, often gives people, that's the language. That's what I meant. So those one and two are two things about already knowing, but then, as I say, affirming, but having a better way to describe what I already knew. But what about this one then? <clears throat> think about when you do and when you don't say what you think. Your profile is suggesting that maybe sometimes there may be too little, you may be, a, sorry, a little too accommodating. Had you thought about that? You don't say what you think. Why don't you say what you think? Are you being too accommodating? Now, whether this hits your button or not, this is an example of what I call discovery. Because if you are thinking, maybe I am, I wonder, I, hadn't, I should think more about that, etc. So that's what I call that discovery reaction. And again, you will see it in your feedback process where they're going through that. As I say, the picture is there. You see their eyes look up to the ceiling. Mm. Am I really? Mm. I wonder. So what you're doing now is you are stretching the envelope of their pre-existing self-view. You're inviting them to consider with the potential for reformulating, maybe I am a little too accommodating. Do I like that? Do I want to be like, why am I like that? So you get the person into a whole frame of discovery, consideration, which is a prerequisite for change. But then you have the one where it says, your desire to be helpful may sometimes mean you overstep boundaries and people find you rude and abrasive. Now, why have I chosen that? Because most people in this audience are very unlikely to agree with that. No, I'm not. I'm highly skilled. I've learned. Well, no, it's my natural self, but I've also learned the technique of not being abrasive. Okay. So I'm trying here to simulate the reaction, which is I don't agree with the feedback. It's a challenge then to the pre-existing view. I am not like that. And that challenge is something which so often is underused. When people push back and say, well, no, that's wrong. It's too often, it's too easy for us as coaches or psychometric feedback givers or whatever to say, well, it can't get it wrong, or that person in the 360, they are a bit of an idiot, yeah, or whatever, you know, so we collude with the bits that they don't agree with. And that is, you are, what you're doing here is you are probably dismissing the most valuable part of the learning process. Because if the source has credibility, and that's what you had to establish early on, you know, there is, then this challenge, you now are into that part which says, well, I don't agree with that. But why is it coming at me like that? What is happening? What are they seeing that I'm not recognising? Am I blind to it? What is that questionnaire picking up on, on things that, you know, I really wouldn't have said that about myself? And having ways of getting into that challenge is really useful. And one of the things I use is the 1% rule. The 1% rule being that there's always 1% of truth in all the feedback that I get. So I don't agree with it. What's the 1%? There's something in this. Or well, that person, they're saying that, but they don't know me. What's the 1%? And that 1% may be, you know, so I think back to what I said about identity. It's not attacking my whole identity, 
but is there a strand, an element in me here that is saying, maybe there is a bit of truth. Let me think where that could be. And I invite people to roam around in their life and find places where it might have a little bit of truth to it. Maybe you are a bit abrasive sometimes, you know, but that's only when I'm with real idiots, you know, or whatever my story unfolds. And so often you also find that people say, well, that maybe that was true when I was younger, but not anymore, because as we grow, we learn to manage certainly the things that we don't like ourselves in ourselves and the challenges are often highlighting the things that people don't like in themselves. To throw that away is such a waste. So to remind you then, the ACDC model is saying, let's see if you remember, what does the A stand for? I know you're all on mute, so I'm not hearing anything. Affirmation. I'm... Affirmation. I agree with that. And I don't want to trivialise that because that is an important part of the engaging, you know, process. And of course, you know, any feedback should contain a fair amount of truth, reality, who I am, what I believe, etc. And the C stands for communication. OK, better ways of saying what I already knew. And then we go into this thing which is beginning to transform the discovery. The D is for discovery. The consideration of things. I'm not rejecting it out of hand, but I, I am wondering more. And as I say, in, in, I, I always find the words I wonder really useful in my processes. You know, um, certainly in psychometric feedback. And I wonder what this could mean. Because, you know, in, in feedback, we're not telling people what it means. We're introducing, I wonder what it could mean. Let's talk about that. Let's explore that. And the C then was challenge. ACDC. I found it an easy mnemonic just to remind me easily. When you're in the chair, when you're in the flow of a process, it's very difficult to use models because, you know, they can interrupt the process. But this is always, I see that. And therefore, how am I going to deal with that? And so what this does is it transforms the way in which we handle disagreement with whatever process and feedback process that we've got going. And so I think that's in the way over there, isn't it now? It's the surprises. Sorry about this. It's the surprises that lead to challenge and change. And the three useful rules in this are Make sure that the feedback source is credible. Make sure that there is a deep understanding of the message that is coming so that you explore it fully. What does abrasive mean, et cetera, et cetera. And anticipating learning that, that you are willing, sorry, to let go. Because having said there is always 1%, there are times when you're going to find it more useful to say, well, maybe they are wrong. Maybe the questionnaire isn't accurate in that regard. You need to be able to let go, but that should not be the first reaction. So I say that finding the things that people disagree with is the gold dust, okay? And that leads you into this process of exploration and again, for those of you that aren't involved in psychometrics or using psychometrics, this is something I bang on about all the time because so often psychometrics are used as, well, let me tell you what it means, explanation, as opposed to, I wonder what it's suggesting, et cetera, and you're exploring. And I always say, you know, the person knows more about themselves than I do, you know, but I am just helping them to explore, which is what the coaching process is. Another tip 
in making feedback more effective is creating the time for reflection. Because when I first started coaching, the model was a two hour session. And, you know, if you charge a lot of money, you've got to give them the maximum. So you've got to be there all the time. And that is not necessarily true. And I actually sort of uh, got two sources for this process. But to give people time for reflection, there are lots of little tips in that. One of them is uh, certainly with the psychometrics when we're giving feedback, there is we've had a discussion about part of the profile and the person, this thing, and I will often say, well, let me just summarize what I've heard you say there, etc." And I always say I take notes because I blame my poor memory, you know, and I need to do this and we're going to have another session, etc. But while I do that, what about this? And I'll give people some space while I'm writing notes. And sometimes I'm writing, I'm just giving them time. But you're creating that time in your conversation for them to reflect without your eyes being on them because that's quite intimidating sometimes. So this is about creating time for reflection within the process. There is then the other method, which is to say, hmm, we've been here for an hour. Um, I'd like to reflect a little bit more on what we've been talking about and uh, maybe useful for you to do that. Uh, so let's take a short break. Let's go away and, you know, have five minutes or whatever on our own and come back. And that is such a useful thing because it allows you in your free flowing discussion to gather your thoughts, but for them to gather things that are landing on them, that are important to them. Because when they come back, they're in a different place then. And you say, so, so where are we in now? Are we on track? Are we meeting the purpose that we had for this session, et cetera? So it allows all that grouping. And that sounds easier to do in a two hour session than in a one hour session or even a half hour session. But what I found is that even in the shorter sessions to take a break, if it's half an hour after 20 minutes, let's take a short break, you know, and reflect and come back. And what you're doing is you are signaling the end game of that session so that you are helping them to refocus and bring back the things that are most important to them. So all the stuff that you've given, all the feedback that you've given, you're then picking up on the things and helping them to gather it together. Um, and when you're running a coaching process, very often you've got the time in between the sessions anyway to do that. So taking a break somewhere along that within or physically in the session, etc. Now, finally, <clears throat> I want to talk about the uh, idea of bringing third party feedback into the session. And with that, what we've got is any kind of feedback. I'm saying use the ACDC thing to recognize what's going on. But what is interesting when you use a psychometric is although it is really only the person that is, we'll change the dynamic with this, the person themselves who completed the questionnaire, it is interesting how it does change the dynamic. Because when you're there and talking about this and looking at and then you bring in, well, let's see what the profile suggests. Okay. And that comes in. It is like bringing another person into the room. Although it's only them who've said it, the dynamic is actually changed quite significantly. Because you've been there talking and now you're looking at this third element and it does change. And that can be a very useful thing to do. And there's another thing that we can do as well, which is to bring in different third party feedback. And that can be like bringing in a wise counsellor into the room. Now, for this, um, I don't actually put 360 into this, but uh, Helen, you know, we've got uh, for our psychometrics, we have for some of them anyway, what we call the paired process, where the person can uh, nominate someone to answer the questionnaire about them, i.e. how they come across. 
And that is really bringing in third party feedback into the session without the person having to be there. Of course, you can do it by saying, well, look, here are some ideas. Go and talk to people and get some feedback. But it's quite different face to face going and saying, well, how do you see me, et cetera, to them doing a questionnaire, which then comes back with the same structure as you when you completed the questionnaire. So there's a much more direct comparison of what you're saying about yourself and what they're saying about themselves. And that paired process then is something which again changes the dynamic of the feedback that you've got. And the final bit was really about how do you help learning to continue? Because I've certainly found that with psychometrics, people get the report, find it really useful, and it goes and sits in the file, they get on with the day job, and the urgencies take over, and they don't maximize the learning that they can have from that. Okay, um, <clears throat> so how can we do that? And one of the ways is to invite people to go public. When they are coaching with you, you say, who knows you're doing this? Does anyone know you're doing this? And so I'm using this slide not as a 360 now, but to think, who are the people that might notice the change that we are hoping to facilitate here? You're entering this not to remain the same, but to change. What is it that we're trying to change here? Is it your relationships, your persuasiveness? What, what is it? And who's going to notice whether it's being effective? And in that process, then you can say, well, look, you know, there's things, you know, the learning needs to continue. Who are going to be your eyes and ears as you go through this development process with me that's going to be able to give you some feedback on what they're noticing? And so I get to people to nominate what I call a reference group. And that needs quite a lot of discussion. You know, sometimes all people say, well, you know, OK, and they choose safe people to be their eyes and ears. Sometimes they choose status people to be their eyes and ears. Well, OK, my boss then, because they want to be visible to them. OK. Um, and sometimes, and this is something that can be really useful, who is your greatest critic in terms of what you're doing now and why we're going through this process anyway? What do you think they're seeing? What if you approach them and said, look, I'm going through this coaching and I've identified some things that I want to work on, okay? This can be quite challenging for people to do, but then, you know, will you help me in this? If, you know, give me feedback at various stages. Can I come to you and say, is it working or not? And sometimes what you get is that people's greatest critics become their most helpful, you know, buddy in this whole process. So you can, you can nominate a whole range of people to do this but the idea of a reference group which is it is going public it's not putting it on a notice board but it is saying these selected people i'm going to tell them this is what i'm doing this is what i'm trying to achieve will you help me and can i come to you and ask you for feedback as we go through this and i think that is a great way of making a coaching session session go outside the walls of the environment in which you're in so this is a, a slide I use as uh, an example using a psychometric feedback, which takes me back to the ACDC thing, which is where I really honed that ACDC thing, which was giving feedback to an individual, uh, a young lad who didn't really want the feedback anyway. Uh, it was his mum who was driving him. And just seeing the change in him, as he went through, so he had a couple of reports and he went through that. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can see that. Is this me? You know, and he was sort of slowly getting interested from being a fairly inarticulate 
teenager who didn't really want to be there to finding that the language of the report was helping him to think about and recognizing himself um and that whole thing about and yeah oh yeah that's it so going you know through to the communication um and sowing those seeds for thinking about maybe i am so i think that's what i've got to say i don't know how long i took on that uh hmm. A bit longer than I expected. So. Perfect timing, Roy. Just sadly, we haven't got time for for a Q and A, thoughts, reactions. Um, I think what I would suggest, unless there's one burning question, let, let's just have a, one burning question. I'm going to let you, whoever whoever's first to unmute, jump in. Are you all just reflecting? No, no, that's absolutely fine. If not, Henrietta's got her hand. Henrietta, up. oh, I can't see everybody on my screen. Henrietta, jump in. Um, I put a comment up as you were talking, all right, about the whole bit about the credibility, and I think for me that remains the big thing about the credibility, yeah. because I get clients because I do some coaching through a platform where I don't uh, know the briefing is um to work with somebody on a psychometric test that's already been done with them. And so often, well not quite often I see only a couple of people have responded and they have responded from a very difficult place, such as you're not bombastic enough. You need to go in there and you know basically shout at staff when things are going wrong. And you know that is kind of it's coming in from such an uncredible, you know, such a strange place. And so against the personality of the person I'm working with, that it's kind of coloring for them the whole psychometric test. And, you know, as a leadership coach, I can't say to people, yes, you need to, you know, yes, of course you will want to consider the idea of going and shouting at people when you know perfectly well that doesn't work. Yes. Well, uh, if you're not in the driving <laughs> choosing the uh, questionnaire or whatever, then it's very difficult. Um, but, um, you know, you, you you can help to frame it. I mean, one of the things that we do more and more now is that we get people to watch preparation videos before they complete the questionnaire so that they understand what they are. And you get away from the what, what I see as the rigidity uh, and sometimes the directiveness of the way in which some of these psychometrics present themselves. Because um, I don't see them any any of them in that light. You know, they're only self-report and they're reflecting back and it may be a useful model, um, but it can't tell you. And people don't understand that. Um, so yeah, clearly I prefer to use questionnaires where the reports have been chosen by me that don't have that style. If they are, I mean, making suggestions like that from a self-report questionnaire is, uh, well, I'll say I think it's wrong. <laughs> but you could um, so I would just take it what is behind this it is saying is it go and shout at people basically you aren't expressing your opinions enough okay now shouting might not be the method but is there a message in there so you can take it to go behind the style of that report into something that's more useful Right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Henrietta. And I'm sorry to cut you short, but we are on half past one. I appreciate you've got tight diaries, I'm sure. Um, Roy, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to you. I'd like to finish with a, a round of applause to say thank you so much for putting this together and fascinating discussion. Um, one, one question did come through to me directly was, are you happy to share the slides? Are you happy to share the slides with me and I will pass those on? Yes, I need to think about the um, the Schutz uh, slide on defensiveness. I have, wouldn't have permission, so I might have to crop okay. a couple of those. That's right. We we can. Uh, I mean, I, Schutz no longer alive. Maybe he won't worry. We'll we'll, we'll have a chat about that, but I won't okay. want to um, yeah, yeah. to to go wrong there. Okay. Um, 
That's great. And also, I will share the recording with everyone who's been present on the call today. And of course, with your contact details, Roy, should anyone want to get in touch, because I know you do all sorts of training courses. Um, I've been on many of them over the years, can only highly recommend you. So um, I will share the information. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you again for coming along. And yes, yeah, some lovely comments coming up saying fascinating, as always. So thank you again, Roy. And thank you to everyone for joining us today.